all of you today. It has been a phenomenal year for her. If you don't know, um, last year, Venus Williams bought one of Sheena Rose's pieces from her town collection. She is one of the ambassadors for Cara Festa this summer. Yes. She has an upcoming show at the United Nations. And she is here this weekend with us in part for the work that she has been doing with Makata. So Sheena, congratulations. Um, as a Bayesian woman, I have to say, like, I am very proud of you. I know Thank that you we tomorrow. are all very proud of you, and you represent our beautiful little island very well. So Sheena, my first question to you, that when I was home in Barbados not too long ago, we were sitting on your couch, and so I in some ways feel like I'm having deja vu, except this is a larger conversation um, mm -hmm. with, with more couches. <laughs> your, your work is in some ways a, a counterpoint to a lot of the narratives that people often think about. When they think about Barbados specifically and the Caribbean more broadly, talk a little bit about how you, your, over the course of your career, your work has evolved to sort of counter some of those narratives. Okay. Thank you to my best. Got me blushing. Oh, y'all got me blushing. <laughs> Representing. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> anyway. Um, so... How my work like develop? Well, I remember me and Tamara, we were in my tiny studio, but soon getting a bigger one. Um, I remember I told Tamara my work really started when I was looking at personal dreams and and I remember my first and um, exhibition was at school with the bachelors when I was about to get my bachelors. And the work I love to make people uncomfortable. I love <laughs> I love to be controversial. I love to basically break that boundary, barrier, you know? And I did these animations that one of them, I was like nude, I was naked. And my parents begged me not to show it. And that even excited me more. I was like, what? I gonna be a rebel. So, <laughs> they, you know, and they begged me and the teachers told them it was one of my best animations. Um, I was um, inspired by William Kendrick, a South African artist and I was really intrigued by the hand-drawn animation and I didn't know that animation could be treated as uh, art, art piece rather than entertainment. So when I saw the, these animations with me naked, me in a man, uh, female man's bathroom and you know obviously messing myself and so on, uh, people walk in and say you need Jesus right and, and just write these things on someone literally run out and I'm like oh I love that. You know, instead of feeling insulted, I felt like more intrigued. So I did this animation when I finished um, in 2000, 2008 with my bachelor's. I did this animation called Tongue, and I just wanted to show the normal lifestyle of Barbados. I was tired of the vendors. I was tired of the green monkeys. I was tired of just showing this one side of Barbados. And I just, I'm a girl that loves to shop. So I just wanted to show myself shopping in down. So honestly speaking, I didn't expect that um, animation to blow up. And David Bailey, a curator from London, came and then he invited like Kara Walker, Alfredo Jar, and I and they told me they really loved the work. And I like, whoa. And from there I started to like I went to Alice Yard in Trinidad. I went to South Africa, Cape Town, I went to all of these countries and did residencies. And it was culture shock because I stereotyped these countries. So I thought South Africa was Africa, like the stereotype of Africa. I thought that Kentucky was New York. I went and went to Suriname, lived in the jungle for three months in uh, Tembe and Mungo, Tembe Art Studio. You know, I, I learned a lot. I, I really stereotyped people and I was also stereotyped. Like I could understand why people stereotyped me and I got exhausted by that. So the more I worked, the more I wanted to tell somewhat the truth of how we really live. Uh, uh, so the sweet gossip pop up when I was asking myself, so Jamaican pop culture, they're known for dance hall. So what are we known for? Maybe gossip. <laughs> gossip. <laughs> but you know, and people st stood quiet because they never argue and say, that's not true. Because I grew up watching Bajan Bus Stop, which was a TV show, and they had this character named Malicious Pearly. Malicious in Barbados means nosy. Always want to know your business. So I said, hmm. So, I, so when I walk in the street of Bridgetown, I would hear, girl, yeah, um, look how she digging she panty. Or look how she bubby falling out. 
So there and then people say, but you were criticizing a lot of women though. What, what happened to you men? So I started to think about it. And then when I went to UNCG, I started to really start to think of myself as a black Caribbean woman. I started to look at material that associated with women, such as makeup and nails and so on, because I could be tomboyish. And then when I went back home now, I started to do more performances and start looking at myself in the space and playing with the idea of stereotypes. So I'm giving you what you think of me, or perhaps I'm exaggerating it. Yeah. So playing with this idea of stereotypes and continuing this conversation about counter narratives, I'm not sure how many of you were able to see Sheena's performance at Makata on Friday, um, but it brings me to Island and Monster, which is this really wonderful, evocative performance that in some ways shows this emotional tug of war mm -hmm. of you dealing with feelings of belonging or not belonging that I think anyone who has ever moved or anyone who has ever been an immigrant and, and is in a new place can really relate to. Talk about the genesis of, of Island and Monster and, toward, and what it took for you to transform for that piece. Um, what it took me, um, I remember at UNCG, before I went to UNCG, I just saw myself as a Carib Caribbean woman. So when I was in North Carolina, I p decided to put myself in a box because living in the States, it kind of somewhat forced me to think of myself more as race, as culture, as gender. And I just started to realize that Barbados is really definitely an English place, you know, dominated by English, English. and then I start thinking of me as a gender, and then I grew up tired here. I like a young lady, so I like man want have boys sometimes. So that's how the characters Mr. Fox and then pop up, and so on. But then when I had to go back home, my career was really booming in the states while I was studying. I had this fear of going home because it, it we, the galleries are shutting down. We don't have an art market there. Um, people are somewhat feeling not as encouraged because again like you my parents have been so supportive you know so i was scared that i felt like a giant i felt like my career was really growing and then coming back to barbados so i had this tremendous tremendous fear i was scared of being lonely i was scared that no one would understand me no more and it somewhat confirmed it a little bit so i was hoping it wouldn't confirm so I call myself a monster before I went to Barbados because being in North Carolina, I, was, I felt like the only foreigner there. Like, and then when I hear myself talk sometimes, I can hear my accent more. And then sometimes, like, how we be just speak, it might, like, I mean, like, girl, how you doing? Yeah, that's real good. But if, <laughs> if I talk so now in, outside that content, I sound aggressive to me, or I sound like they don't understand and might be a little nervous. So I started to feel like this monster. And then going home now, now I get the, some of the American culture in me now. And when I went back home, I didn't sound beige anymore. So I was like, I, I don't sound American here. I don't sound beige in there. I still got a beige in that sense, but I still had certain different mannerism. And I had Amsterdam um, mannerism, Suriname, Trinidad, it, so I didn't know what to define myself anymore. So I felt like this giant bat into this small space, and I felt like if I had this conflict, like more to myself. So to that point, and sort of dealing <coughs> and working through that conflict, at what point did you decide that you needed to release that in the form of a performance art piece? And part of the reason I ask that is for those of you who don't know, and I will let Sheena better define her work a little bit later, she does everything from performance art to drawings to paintings. What made you decide this needs to be a performance piece? Was there a catalyst? Was there something that happened mm -hmm. when you got home? Was there an interaction, a conversation that made you decide, you know what, this is it, this is the moment. And then once you decided that, how did you go about developing the characters Island and Monster that we saw on Friday in Mokata? Mm. So I, people always used to say I'm very animated. I never understand that because to me it feels so like natural and I always want to be like a cartoonist, a storyteller and I always used to draw comic books to myself. I always imagine these stories, dramatic stories. So 
I did tone drawings, yes, but I always imagined myself up to now as a cartoonist. So when I was in North Carolina, I got these um, sketchbooks and I decided to draw out my true, true, true feeling. And then I guess what, um, I guess what, like, shot people that I share it on the social media, my very, very private personal life and call them another con confession, hashtag another confession. Um, I am so extremely tired because I had to do this work and I miss home. Hashtag another confession. So people is like, you actually sharing your personal life to the open like that? So then when I decided one day, truly I had, honestly speaking, I had hate myself. And I decided to create this thing called, finally I love myself on Instagram. And I wanted to show people I'm working on myself. So. The first performance I did, not the first ever, but the first performance I did during that time, I had on heart shit um, glasses, and I was leaning towards the iPad to see how close I could get within the 15 seconds that Instagram allowed me to. So my body become physical. So then I wanted to see how it feels to be falling in love, literally. So I would fall down and fall down all the time. So I wanted to show people when I draw, yes, it might be strong and like personal, but when I act it, I wanted people to see it. And when I paint it, I want them to feel it. So when I paint, it becomes physical. And then I would take pictures and act it out. So that's still a form of performance and then paint it. So everything is like physical to me. It got to feel right. So it made people uncomfortable because they were like, she just want attention. Why is she sharing out your business like that? It wasn't about that. It was like... I sure there's somebody that understand this, you know, I sure you must be going through this, man. I can't be the only body. So when I learned Master Papa, no, drawing was not enough for me. I could write it, I could draw it, I could share it, but I had to like, there was a moment I had taught myself physical and I wanted like the viewers to see that, to make them like, whoa, she is serious. So when I did Island of Monster, I was not two characters made up. I was myself. I was two of myself talking to myself. And I wanted to show Monster is protect me. There were actually three characters. There was the artist. She, she came into Mokata. That is me, tired, mentally tired. Tired of trying to speak out all the time. So whenever I draw that, so it's in my head, how can I share this? Monster is protecting me because I'm a very shy person. And people will be like, what? You're so different. So it's me actually bringing out monster to protect me. And Island, I wanted to see how Island look as, Barbados look as a person. Because I've been talking a lot on the social media. People are listening to me, but sometimes... There's a movement going on, or sometimes people just got a lot of talk. So I said, you know what? I want to see Barbados. Barbados, how do you look like? So there's another side of me being seductive. So I was like, Barbados is beautiful, but there's more than that. So it was more, I wanted to feel at peace. I wanted to talk to Barbados. So that way, call Island of Monster. So to your point about that, one of the things I love about Sheena is the authenticity in her work. Like she is herself at all times. Like the Sheena that you see sitting in this room is the same Sheena that was talking to me like on her couch in front of no audience. And so to your point about like Barbadian society and, and wanting to show Barbados as it is, good, bad, and different, what has the reception been to Island and Monster and more broadly like town and sweet gossip? Because Barbadian society, like a lot of other Caribbean islands, can be a little bit conservative, right? There's sort of this idea and this notion of, you know, you don't talk your business in the street, mm -hmm. what happens in this house stays in this house mm -hmm. type of thing. Talk about the, the reception of your work and sort of where your communities of support are coming from. Well, right now, I was just talking to at Hatun and Instagram. I told him before that I am shocked this is happening. This is a girl that used to be on social media just ranting, 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 ranting all the time and probably get a lot of people nerves tired like here she goes again and I'm like I'm just a lot of people will message me privately will come to me give me a hug and say girl keep going you're brave and I'm like brave I'm like I'm just doing it 
You know, so I like, they're not, a, no, I can't do anything. What are you scared about? Just do it. You know, so I, I don't know if I free rest. The only fearless is if I, Carmen would know, like I crumble real fast if it barely meant one little mistake, but you'll see me naked like, ah, I'm here, I'm naked. So I, I <laughs> but I, I find that I've been getting, there's something that's happening now. This is a big moment, like especially, like I watch the other islands, but I'm so happy to see my own island. Like you're from Barbados. You know, and then there had the other teams from Barbados, from the Caribbean, and we want to see a difference and a change uh, and a development in the art scene in Barbados because there's value. So I think there must be something happening because we're here right now. And it just, I'm not looking, I remember one person insulted me and it still hurt me up to today. That other person said, you think you want to be a savior? That hurt me. Because it's not about me being a savior. It's just me sharing my personal story and hope someone can hear it and they can share theirs too. And not me saving anybody. It's just hoping I could not let people be so scared to speak. That's all. We talked a lot about identity um, and your experiences in the U.S., my experiences in Barbados when I go home for the summers and the way in which people perceive us. And you said something to me that I have often heard from other people, which is that they became aware of their blackness mm. in a way when they came to the U.S. that they weren't necessarily aware of mm -hmm. um, when they were in the Caribbean. So talk a little bit about what that was like for you when you came here as a Fulbright scholar and how the experiences that you had here impacted the way you see black bodies in contemporary art. Mm. And, and if it at all impacted the way you wanted to show us as a people okay so um for me the very first ever race racist or racism i ever encountered in my life i was i went to the moma museum and i was like further up i mean and i had a bad migraine I, I had a horrible migraine and my aunt told me she know you wouldn't get any taxis trust me i said i don't understand she said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get any taxis, trust me. But we were lucky to get one that was parked. But when we were driving, he was driving very slow, and I had a horrible migraine. And when we get to Brooklyn, my aunt said, you drive really slow. You really did that ridiculously. And he said, we don't pick up your kind of people. And that was the first time I ever faced racism. I maybe faced it before in Barbados, but that was the first time I saw myself black. And I look in the mirror. And I look at my nose, I look at my mouth, I look at my chin, I look at everything. And then I did a performance called One Person Many Stories. And I told a story naked because the story was naked. Don't mind me literally naked, the story was naked. So when I went to Barbados, it's like, forget that, put it under the carpet. Because the majority of us are black. So you will feel normal. But then later on, when I started to travel, went to South Africa. Oh, color. I like, huh? You know, and then Suriname. Oh, you have Mungo have a bad reputation. And I like, but majority of these people are black here and they keep their um, African heritage. And then when I went to Amsterdam, Amsterdam seemed the most like open. However, when when I was in another area, I can't remember the area right now, it had a lot of Surinese, it had the darkest people there, and that area had a reputation. I like but here it's so peaceful, I don't, I, I don't get it. So when I went to Barbados now, and like went to, when I went to North Carolina, Mar but I find that I had a lot of blacks there too, but then I sound like a foreigner, my, my accent. So it was black and foreigner. So when I said foreigner, I, I mean, I felt like a real outsider, you know? So what happened, I start to emphasize on black Caribbean women. Right, cause and I find people I love that title, and for my thesis, I had called it Black Caribbean Woman. And when I went to Barbados and talk about, there's a problem here, though. We suffer greatly from classism, mm -hmm. and I realized that they had a huge Facebook fight about racism. And I said, Good, finally, we're talking, we're opening up about this, about time. And I remember this gentleman, Caucasian, messaged me, and we didn't know each other. And um, because I put on his, I started saying, wow, someone wrote about his experience being white in Barbados. I said, 
good for you both time we open both time we tell the truth about each other you will see it in america you will see it in europe but i never hear beijing's white and black open up about it so i think that was an art form so i get inspired by every little moment because someone might see that as conversation that was like a historic moment for me and an art form for me now i would go home and probably study more about black but when i go home i I'm still conscious about black, but my safety zone is because majority are black, I feel a little bit normal there. So jumping off to that point, I remember you told me that when you left the United States and went back to Barbados, <coughs> you began painting more of your figures in your work black mm -hmm. than you previously had. Why is that? Um, when I was always interested, interested in um, colors of the skin, and I didn't see black, I just saw yellow orange blue hint of orange um purple and that's where my new series invisibles pop up um when i was at school i used to paint the skin black but to me i didn't see black i just saw myself you know i just saw colors and i remember a friend of mine when i was doing this week i said i painted skin black at first and when i was about to paint the skin black it was white and she said no aesthetically that's beautiful I said, for real? She said, yeah. Then sweet gossip blew up. It wasn't like I erased the skin purposely. It was just interesting with colors next to each other, like the red and white skin. But then when I went to North Carolina and decided to put myself in a box, then I said, Nash, you know, face it. Face the truth. And the, there's a painting that I think I call Crown or Queen that will be showing at United Nations that half of the face like brown like normal and then polished black because it's like they say you're black you're black so they paint it on black mm -hmm. and then afterwards i start looking back at the the, the undertone of our skin mm -hmm. before we close um who, who, is, she is, who is she knows who is she knows carmen you would know very well <laughs> there's my best friend of one thing carmen last night you say sheena do you love me and i'm like <laughs> carmen what kind of question that is because y'all never see the true side of me when I get like miserable. I would say I am a miserable person. My parents must be watching and they probably agree with me. <laughs> I used to hear that all my life. And when I say miserable, when I was a little girl at six years old, and it's up to now, I still do it. And I think I told you this in Barbados, I think so, no? Well, I, when I was six years old or five years old, I always have an image in my head and I would want it out. I used to sound crazy and maybe still do. And I used to want this image in my head. So I tell my father, Daddy, you could draw this man with a briefcase and a bow tie. I like to be real Pacific. Bow tie with a tie and he going to work. And my father was like, what? So he tried to draw it. And my father was an auditor at the um, government building, um, gov the government. And then I cried bad because the image is still in my head. Up to now, the image is still in my head. So that way they say I'm miserable because once I have an image in my head, I got to get it out. So once the image doesn't look right, then that's where the performance comes. Then that's where the paintings come. Then that's where the mixed media and the many, 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 many more to it feel right. So yes, I would say I'm a determined person, I'm a friendly person, I'm a miserable person, um, I'm a very straightforward, they say very honest person, I don't like, as we basically say, Skylar, meaning I don't like to play, you know, so I don't like to waste time, time is a matter to me, I like to have fun, I'm a shopper, all that you can see. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yes, that's who I am. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>